Today is the fourth Sunday, the fourth Sunday after Epiphany here in Toronto. The epistle is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Catholics in Rome, chapter 13. Brethren, owe no man anything except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. And if there is if there's any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love does no evil to a neighbor. Love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. The Holy Gospel. <clears throat> Taken from St. Matthew chapter 8. At that time, Jesus got into a boat, and his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was covered by the waves. But he was asleep. So they came and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. But he said to them, Why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the sea, and there came a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Thus are the words of the Sacred Scripture. Mary Doherty, who, who died last week, and uh, the seminarians, we went down to have her funeral mass. She'll be buried in San Diego with her family. I also uh, pray for another lady who's dying in Belgium. And we also uh, want to thank everyone who, in any way, by prayer or uh, donations, have helped to obtain the property um, that will be certainly a great benefit for the seminary of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. So we really thank you for your prayers and your generosity. Pray for our seminarians. They will undergo uh, exams that will be transferred to this coming week. So they will have midterm exams with oral examinations as well as written. So uh, do pray for them. I'm sure they're very excited about this. But uh, pray for them and... Pray for more seminarians to come. Certainly, uh, one of the greatest concerns of St. Pius X was the, was the restoration of all things in Christ. And the first step to restoration is good priests, forming good priests. Archbishop Lefebvre clearly understood this. And the opposite is true. When the enemies of Christ want to infiltrate and destroy the church, first target is the seminaries. And they did that. They infiltrated the seminaries. And the communists said, since the priests won't become communists, the communists will become priests. And they infiltrated the church in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. And by the time of Vatican II, you had bishops who were already infiltrators. This is no secret. Uh, Bella Dodd, the great communist convert, told this to Archbishop to Bishop Sheen that they had sent thousands into the U.S. seminaries and in Canada. And that also goes for the, um, <clears throat> for the flag, purple flag-waving fifis. Um, they also infiltrated the church, and the rectors of seminaries put out the good men, good men who were wanted to be good priests, and put them out of the seminary and brought in these, these uh, wilted flowers. And uh, the, the intention is to implode the church, destroy it from within. And Pius X saw it come in, as we all know, well over 100 years ago. So, so this is no surprise. And we see even the College of Bishops that Christ chose, there was an infiltrator and a traitor from within. And our Lord even knew it. He knew Judas's heart. He knew everything he was up to in the dark. He knew about his stealing. He knew about his drunkenness. He knew about his, 
his uh, marauding, and um, he told, he prayed, he, uh, he tried to appeal to Judas, even in the last moment, kneeling before him. Think of this, the living God who created all the universe, heaven and hell, all the billions of angels, kneeling before Judas, appealing to his, whatever he had left in his heart, to, to move his heart to repentance, washed his feet, and Judas, Judas was hardened, and he turned from the, the love and mercy of God and his appeals of the Sacred Heart. So, if that can happen in Christ's seminary, certainly it can happen in the Church. And we know now how the Society of Advice the has been infiltrated as well. And now the leaders at the top are, are really destroying the work of Archbishop Lefebvre. And this is a great sadness for all of us, a great sorrow. And the way it's, the way it's being done is even worse. Very slowly, very deceitfully, and very, just everything wrong about it. And uh, so how do we judge? We don't judge the persons necessarily. We judge what is signed in documents. We judge what is said by the sermons and interviews. What is publicly done, that we can judge. And it's on this we have to make a judgment with these modernist popes, like Archbishop Lefebvre did, their modernism, their ecumenism, their collegiality, their mock the destruction of our Catholic faith. These are public actions, and we have to judge that. And it's those things that we have to judge by. And Archbishop Lefebvre made it very clear. These modernist popes, we have, they have a right to our disobedience, and a right to our categorical resistance and refusal to go along with Vatican II and the New Mass. And every Catholic today is obliged to act this way. And look what's happening to the poor Catholics who swallow the poison of modernism and Vatican II and the New Mass. Even a tiny drop of it, they're poisoned. And they end up going liberal, they end up losing their faith, they end up going with the world. And we're all in danger of this because the temptation is great, the pull of the world is strong. The devil is attacking at all sides, and we're not gonna we're not gonna make it, nor keep the faith, nor persevere without a great filial devotion to the Virgin Mary. This is as clear and obvious as day, and we have the hundred years since Our Lady appeared at Fatima this year, 2017, a hundred years ago. She told the Pope, consecrate Russia to my back of heart, and there will be peace, the true peace, that is the reign of Christ the King, throughout all the governments and constitutions and the laws of the country. And the Popes have, have slapped her in the face, one by one. So these are hard days, definitely. But um, anyway, pray for the seminary and our seminary in Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Because um, we're often attacked. Who are you, priests, with no bishop's approval to start a seminary? Well, we are no, we're nobody. We know that. But the Catholic Church demands seminaries. The popes of tradition demand seminaries. We tell you married people, take the children God sends you. This is the teaching of the command of God right out of his own mouth. Three times in the book of Genesis. Three commands in three separate Latin words. In plemini, crescite, and replete. Three words commanding Adam and Eve to take the children God sends, to increase and multiply, and spread throughout the whole world, earth. So if God commands the, the taking of children... For the married, how much more for us who are married to the church, married to the Blessed Virgin Mary, married to God. We have to bring the children, spiritual children, that is future priests who will continue the Mass, sacraments, and so forth. So we, we simply continue the work of Archbishop Lefebvre. That's all we want to do. We have no interest in starting some new organization, some new group. 
We want to just simply stay Catholic. And in the line of our great founder, Archbishop Lefebvre. So that means neither going to the right by Sedevicantism, nor to the left by modernism and compromise with Vatican II and the new mass. And I wish it wasn't true, but the facts are there. The documents are there, you can read them. Uh, Bishop Fillet in the Doctrinal Declaration in 2012 signed on to accepting the new mass in the so-called light of tradition, accepting religious liberty, which he said was very limited at the council, but it's the worst heresies. All the popes have a long list of <laughs> um, <clears throat> scornful adjectives for these heresies of religious liberty. Delirium, insanity, condemned, to be avoided, to be rebuked. The list is quite long. And um, so the, the religious liberty of Vatican II is not limited, as our Bishop Fillet tries to say. It is poison, it is heresy, it is destructive to souls and to Christ himself. <clears throat> so we, we simply have to continue. And what did we see in any persecution what did the bishops do? Their first concern was preserve the faith and preserve the seminaries, train the future priests. Because without priests, who's going to baptize your babies? Except in cases of emergency, obviously. Who's going to give First Communion? Who's going to offer the sacrifice of the Mass? Who's going to preach the true doctrine and warn you of the deceits of the devil and the spirit of the world? and the, the enemy within, the, our own flesh and concupiscence. Who's going to, to inspire you to keep fighting for heaven and preach the true, good Catholic doctrine? <coughs> and who's going to be there to marry you, your daughters and your sons? And who's going to be there to anoint you on your deathbed with the church's blessings and the last blessings of the hour of death, which can wash away your, one's whole purgatory? That's a, such a powerful blessing with extreme unction. <clears throat> Without priests, the church doesn't continue. But this is common sense. So we continue that work of Archbishop Lefebvre, and we trust in the, the Virgin Mary. And um, at first, Bishop Williamson, at the very first, was very supportive. And we were very grateful. We were very happy about this. This is just normal that the bishop look after the formation of its future priests. But um, <clears throat> but things have turned since, as we know, and um, you know I, it's, it's just very saddening that we see the four bishops of Bishop Lefebvre, all of them have in some way turned from him and have gone off course, and Bishop Fillet is promoting a, going with modernist Rome and accepting the modernist ideas. <clears throat> Bishop Williamson promoting, sadly, and it's hard for me still to believe, I just wish it wasn't true, but I beg you to pray for them, you know, they can always turn around, they can always, today, come out and say, I was wrong, let's get back to the line of Archbishop Lefebvre, and uh, I renounce what I said before. It would be very easy. We all make mistakes, right? We all know that. To mis make mistakes is human. But to persevere in the error is diabolical. And that's what's getting a little frightening right now. So promoting that you can go to the New Mass and find grace, New Mass miracles. And uh, our Lord did say towards those days, they, there will be miracles to deceive even the elect. And now we've got miracles of the New Mass, so-called New Mass hosts. New Mass, incorrupt, so-called incorrupt bodies of Pope John the Twenty-Third and now Pope John Paul II, <laughs> and and the, Marti the morticians say they're so pumped with chemicals they should last a few hundred years. And we know the power of chemicals today; they can preserve the food forever on the shelves, and they can preserve a de dead body for quite a long, long list of decades. So the incorrupt so-called incorrupt saints of these new mass, uh, they're not believable. They're not believable. And then uh, many of the so-called apparitions of our time, Medjugorje, and 
and uh, false apparitions at Bayside, and these are dangerous apparitions. And so it's, it's nothing new in the church, but we have to hold the line of our founder. Archbishop Lefebvre handled this crisis with a great strong faith, with the most sound theology, the most sound prudence. And one of the proofs that he did not want Sede de Cantus in the Society of St. Pius X that he founded, not the one now, the new one of Bishop Fallet, but the new one Archbishop of Feb founded, he, he, he had all the priests take an oath that we pray for in the Mass by name the reigning Vicar of Christ. So that's the oath we all took. So I know these are, as far as the papacy is concerned, it's scandal after scandal after scandal. Even Pope Francis called Trump the same, another Hitler. <laughs> so, where are we going? But we have to learn from our forefathers in the faith. What did the Israelites do, the good ones, when Solomon went bad? And he built up altars to the false gods and burnt incense and sacrificed pigs to the false gods. Solomon, the great king, raised up by God and anointed successor to David, the great king. David, who was faithful, King David, and died a holy death, defending the faith and smashing all idolatry and false worship. Solomon started off really good. Then he went bad. And he started having many wives, and soon he had two, three to four hundred concubines. And all these women lured him away from the true faith. But we see that the real, the true good the Catholics of those days, that is, those who had the true Catholic the faith, because they believed in Christ to come, they didn't, they didn't say Solomon's not king, the one anointed by God, but they did say he's bad and we cannot follow him. And Christ who stood before Annas and Caiaphas, these, these were the high priests, these were the Pope, that was the Pope of the Old Testament, Caiaphas, the high priest. Christ, the living God, the Messiah, was standing right in front of him, and he refused the light. But Christ still respected his authority. Christ still acknowledged and obeyed his authority, but not the false obedience, because Christ, when he told him, tell us, if you are Christ, the Son of the living God, Christ didn't mince words. He said it very clearly. Tutixisti, you said it. I am. And then he went on to quote Daniel, how, uh, the vision of Daniel, how Christ will come with power and majesty. So, dear faithful, it's very important then that you read Archbishop Lefebvre's writings. It's very important that you go back to the great popes. And I encourage you to read the refreshing encyclicals of Pope Pius VI, Autorum Fide, who, who condemns the use of ambiguous language and playing with language to, to describe and explain the Holy Catholic faith. He condemns that very idea. And that also condemns the doctrinal declaration that Bishop Follet signed because it's, it's this way of speaking. It's putting the poison in, like Vatican II documents, the poison is sown in in a deceitful way. But it's there, it's very clear. And uh, I encourage you to read the great encyclicals of Pius IX, a Quanta Cura, and the Syllabus of Errors. And then, of course, the great Pope Leo XIII. All his doctrine is very clear, very good, very right on, and it's not confusing. And then, of course, St. Pius X. And then Pius XI, condemning ecumenism, Mortali Marimos, and um, his great encyclical, of course, on the kingship of Christ. And just in case, you know, a lot of liberal Catholics will say, well, economics and politics has nothing to do with the Catholic religion. Religion is for the church and Sunday, and economics and politics is for everyday life, and they're separate. And dear friends, if we think that way, we are true liberal Catholics condemned by the church. <coughs> if I think that way, I am a liberal Catholic. Spit out. Our Lord says, I'd rather you be hot or cold. 
But because you're a newborn, a liberal Catholic trying to mix principles of Christ the King with principles of the world and masonry, you can't mix them. And if in the lukewarm Catholics, Christ said, I will, I will begin to vomit them out of my mouth. What a graphic way of saying it, isn't it? I will begin to vomit you out of my mouth. Christ hates the liberal Catholic. Pius IX said, this is the greatest enemy of the church, worse than the, the red communists, is the modernist and liberal Catholic. And the liberal Catholics will say, oh, economics and politics has nothing to do with Christ the King. We Catholics say, politics and economics and all of the social life, everything has everything to do with Christ the King. Because he's God and he's King of all. And that's why our, our seminarians have just been studying the great encyclical of Pius XI condemning communism as intrinsically evil. And, and communism is an atheistic system. And he condemned it because it says man doesn't have an eternal soul. Society is just a, a human invention from evolution. And it doesn't have eternal life to prepare for. And God has nothing to do with politics or economics. And that communism was condemned many times. By Pius IX even, be, before the Bolshevik Revolution. And uh, communism, one of their great aims is child care centers, get the woman out of the home, get her in pants, destroy the woman, you've destroyed the family. That's a huge goal, and they're doing it. They're doing it. The spreading of abortion, the financing of drugs, the drug industry. That's all supported by the Judeo Masons and the slash communists. Wall Street, as we know, supported and financed the Bolshevik Revolution. That's no wonder that one of the cardinals in Rome called Vatican II the October Revolution, the October Communist Revolution of 1917. And that's exactly what it was. And another cardinal called it the French Revolution within the Church. And that's out of their own mouths. And these bishops are praising the Communist Revolution and the Masonic Revolution of 1789 and 1776. They're praising it, so they, they love Vatican II. So out of their own mouths, they condemn themselves. Because they know that the Catholic Church, and the great popes, condemned the ideas behind the Masonic Revolution of 1789 and 1776. They condemned the ideas behind 1917 Communist Revolution. So, so we also are going to study... Uh, the encyclical of Rerum Novarum and Quadragesimo Anno. These two encyclicals that speak about economics. It's the popes of the Catholic Church condemning the oppression of the poor, robbing workers of their lawful wages, and putting workers in, in um, conditions that were inhuman. And it was the church that to raise her voice to defend the, the working man. And the popes say, go back to the style of the guilds and uh, let, the, let the employees, excuse me, let the employers take care of their employees and be more of a father. And, um, the, and he, he calls them corporations, Catholic corporations of working guilds, whether it be medical fields, whether it be construction, whether it be engineering, whether it be plumbing or carpentry. And the church speaks about this. And that Christ must be king of the working man and his family. And against communism, it's the Catholic Church that defends, firstly condemns socialism, and defends the right of the father to own his own property. So the Catholic Church is the, is the greatest defender of the family, of the woman, of her modesty, of her defense, of her defense. By keeping, by condemning divorce, which, which is from Christ's own mouth. The Catholic Church in her tradition defends the working class, the working man. And so the, the, the Church in her great tradition, in the voice of the vicars of Christ, who were true good vicars, two truly good popes, speaking in line with all of tradition and the magisterium of the Church, they have raised their voice against socialism, communism, modernism, Zionism, 
of Union Freemasonry, Zionism, One World, and Globalism. They have raised their voice condemning these very things. And we, we need to be anchored in these great teachings of our Mother, the Church. And when we are, we realize, like Archbishop Lefebvre made so clear, Vatican II is blown to bits by all the popes previous. They've condemned it a long time ago. And when we have again a good pope, he will, but the sign that he's going to be a good pope is he's going to take the voice and the position of all the magisterium and the tradition of the church, and therefore condemn in no uncertain terms Vatican II, the new code, new mass, and all the, the horrible destruction and reforms, they call them reforms, they're deforms, the deforms from the, the new religion and the revolution within the church. So that's why the Catholics are reduced to a handful today, we know this, and uh, you have to be careful also of, of uh, the, liberal, the liberal neutralizing of the Catholic resistance. And I, and I want to draw your minds again to the great example in the great Catholic battles in France of the Vendée and also in Austria there was a great um, Catholic farmer with a big family a hard working Catholic man who had a great love for the mass was providing for his wife and family and Napoleon after the French Revolution the second wave Napoleon was coming with his armies to crush Austria and this farmer pulled together all the Catholic people and they resisted in two battles, and they won. And their, they, their battle cry was the honor of the Sacred Heart of Jesus for the altar for the, for the country. And these were Catholic men resisting. And twice he defeated Napoleon's armies. And in the third, he, he lost the battle because he was betrayed from within, as usual. But back to the Vendée, um, there were three events that we got to learn from. First, the, the new government, which was Masonic, of 1789, that chopped off the head of the king and promoting the destruction of the Catholic faith, killing thousands of priests, putting bishops to death, nuns to death, and uh, burning down the Catholic churches, etc., etc., etc. When the revolution tried to crush the Catholic resistance in the Vendée, the Vendée was a huge state, a province, an area in, in the, the western side of France, and the Catholic people would not cave in. They would not give in to the revolution, and they wanted to stay Catholic. So they went to war, and uh, Michael Davies has a great talk, and he has a great little booklet in English on this history called For Altar and Throne. I encourage you, <clears throat> excuse me, I encourage you to, to read it. But in a nutshell, there were many battles, and the Vendée were winning. The Catholic men were winning. And uh, they, they even had gone as far as Nantes, after victory after victory. And they would go into the Catholic Church and sing the Vexilla Regis, and sing the Te Deum. And they would go to confession before every battle, very similar to the Cristeros. So the, the Masons in Paris decided, <coughs> since we can't crush these Vendians, since the, the, the resistance is so strong and they will not bend, then let's offer them peace treaties. Let's offer them agreements. Let's offer them terms of peace. And the great thing about the Vendians is they refused. They refused all their offers of peace. They would not dialogue with the devil. Just like uh, the Virgin Mary didn't dialogue with the devil. She just crushes his head. But Eve dialogued with the devil and got us all in trouble. right? So you don't dialogue with the enemies of Christ. And that's when Archbishop Lefebvre, when he realized these, these men in Rome are really modernists. And Cardinal Ratzinger is, is among the chief of them, destroyers of the church. He said, no more discussion. 
He said this in 1990, seven months before he died. And had Bishop Follet just stood by this, we wouldn't be in the mess we're in. Because the Society of Pius X is now losing many members, the new SSP, to Saturday Contism or to going back to the Novus Ordo. And they're not all coming to the resistance. They should be, because that's what they've been all these years. So uh, Archbishop Lefebvre said, no more discussion. When it comes to uh, dealing with Rome, I will, I will set it at the doctrinal level. And I will ask the Pope, do you believe in the encyclicals of Pius IX, of Pius VI, of Leo XIII, Pius X, and the anti-modernist oath, and Christ the King? And if you don't accept these encyclicals, then no discussion. Because how can there be a discussion when there's no agreement on the very foundation of the Catholic Church, which is the faith? And we all know by our catechism, what is the first foundation for being Catholic? What is it? It's to believe all the Catholic faith. It's the faith that's the first rock of, of being Catholic. We have to believe all the truths God has revealed in Scripture and tradition. So if they don't agree on that, how can there be a discussion? And so Archbishop Lefebvre said, no more discussion until Rome comes back to tradition. So we wait, and we pray for the Pope, we pray for Rome to come back to the Catholic tradition, but we fight on. And you see how God blessed that position. Because all over, up until 2012, there was growth in the society. Schools, seminaries, vocations. Especially in the United States, there were good vocations, and in Canada. And there was great work, and retreats, and the missions. And since, since Bishop Fillet has changed the faith and accepted the Vatican II religion, even partially, it's all collapsing. God is not giving his blessings anymore. He's not giving his graces anymore. And this, is, this should wake them all up. But back to the Vendée. So what did the, 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 Mace, the Republic do? They offered peace treaties with the Vendéans. And they refused. So what was their second step? Second step was, well, let's take the priests, the juring priests. The priests who made the oath, we will no longer preach against the, the Masonic Republic of 1789. And they signed an oath where they won't preach anymore. They'll preach about the saints, they'll preach about the, the springtime flowers, but they're not going to preach against the errors of that time. And these priests were escorted in cassock, bringing the Latin Mass. They were escorted by the soldiers, who were before the soldiers were killing the priests. Now they were using the priests as an instrument to neutralize the Catholic resistance. They escorted them into the towns of the Vendée. The people spat on these priests and the soldiers. They didn't want them. And when the priests were coming into the churches, the ladies would scrub the floor where they walked because they didn't want their church desecrated by these compromising priests. And they did not go to their mass. They did not go to their marriages or baptisms. They did not go. So that wasn't working either. But they used the fake resistance, that is, the juring priests, to try to neutralize the real Catholic resistance. Those Catholics who wanted to just stay Catholic. And we're living in this right now, right now as I speak, the fake resistance. The so-called USML, and the, it's a fake resistance. Because they accept that Vatican II wasn't so bad, they're not condemning it clearly. They accept you can go to the New Mass and get grace. They accept now you can even go to the Seve Cantus Mass, which Archbishop Lefebvre raised his voice, trumpeted his voice against doing. Because you're in danger of losing your faith on the right or the left. Schism or modernism. You cannot go in either ground. And um, so the, the, the fake resistance now, what do they stand on? That's a good question. And I beg you, pray for Bishop Williamson, because 
he shouldn't be saying these things. He should just come back to the position of Archbishop of Fan. So, so must Bishop Soleil. And Bishop Tissi Damari and Bishop Galarenda, well, they're just going along, it's sad to say. They're just going along. And Bishop Tissi, who wrote the book of Archbishop of Fan's life, he knows. He knows. This is not good. So, the fake resistance is, has always been an enemy, of the t an enemy tactic. And it was, it happened in 1988, do you remember? When Archbishop Lefebvre consecrated on that great day the four bishops to continue the Catholic faith and the true sacraments until Rome comes back to tradition. That was very clear to all of us. And Bishop Lefebvre, he, when he consecrated those four bishops, his, his stand was unambiguous. And what happened that same year, 1988? Rome accepted a, a, a fragment of priests who left Ecom because they thought Archbishop of was being schismatic. So they came to Rome, and Cardinal Ratzinger gave, set them up with the Society of St. Peter. And they had to accept Vatican II in the light, so-called light of tradition. They had to accept not to condemn the new Mass. And on those grounds, they set up the SS Peter, which was the fake resistance of 1988. That's exactly what they were. And then the, the false indult masses. They had the Latin mass, but it's, they couldn't condemn Vatican II and the new mass from the pulpit. And that's the catch. And if you can't point out the wolf, then you're a traitor. If a shepherd is to point out the wolf and he can't, bark against the wolves, then he's a useless shepherd. And that's, that's how they tried to neutralize the Catholic resistance of Archbishop Lefebvre. And Archbishop Lefebvre called it the Catholic resistance to the destruction of the Catholic Church. And that's where we want to stand. That's, all, that's where we're obliged to stand, by our baptism, by our baptismal vows. Now, all of us, when we were baptized, in the mouth of our godparents, or if you are adults, out of your own mouth, you renounce Satan. And what else? All his allurements. And one of his biggest allurements is liberal Catholicism and heresy and modernism and all of his works. So every Catholic today on the face of the earth is bound to resist this whole destruction of our Catholic faith and hold the line of our great father, Archbishop Lefebvre, not because we follow him, but because his position was totally in line with all the magisterium of the church and tradition and all the saints. So the great Archbishop Lefebvre, this was his greatness. Was that, his greatness was, as he himself said, we just want to stay Catholic. That was his greatness. And he, he took the means to, to continue the work of the Catholic tradition. <clears throat> Seminaries, forming priests, and taking care of the faithful all over the world who are calling us for the Mass, for the sacraments. And that's, that's one of the things that fake resistance wants to crush, um, is the apostolicity to spread all over the earth the kingship of Christ and the Catholic faith. They don't want that. And so, face, fake peace treaties and dialogue, the, the Vandeans refused, using the priests to neutralize the real Catholic resistance. That's also the tactic of our time. So the Vandeans refused. And then, finally, it was the hunt, head-hunting of the great Charette. Charette was the commanding general of the Vandean armies, and he refused all compromise. And he was like, in our, he was for our time, like Archbishop Lefebvre, for the church. And he refused. And his armies continued to war and battle. And as the armies of the Republic kept coming in, they kept decimating them. And then finally they said, we will come into the Vandee, as one of the generals said for the Masonic armies, he says after he went through a few towns, this is what he wrote to the Danton back in Paris, we massacred everyone 
the young, the old, boys and girls, priests and nuns. We took their babies and crushed them under the hoofs of our horses. We ripped open the bellies of, our, of the mothers and carried the babies alive on the tops of our swords. The Vandeans must be absolutely crushed. And then they did the famous drownings of Nantes, drowning thousands of Catholic people and priests in the, on the pontoon boats. And Archbishop Lefebvre mentions this in his great sermon of 1976 in Lille, France, when Pope Paul VI was about to smash him with a suspension. And Archbishop Lefebvre said, This suspension is invalid, it's null and void, because I cannot accept Vatican II in the new Mass. And, um, and, and so the last tactic was strangle and crush the leaders of the resistance. And that was, at that time, Charette. And they did it to Archbishop Lefebvre, the suspension, so-called excommunication. They tried to kill him, but it didn't work, because the Catholic truth just can't be crushed. And Archbishop Lefebvre said, I am honored to be excommunicated and suspended by this church that, of the pantheon of all religions of Assisi, of the Church of Ecumenism, the Church of Vatican II, the Church of the New Advent, the Church of the, of the New Mass. I'm, an, I'm honored to be excommunicated from this false church. And we stay Catholic. That was his thinking. Now the thinking of the leaders of the SSPX, is, the new SSPX, is let's get back with Rome. We are in an abnormal situation. We have to be under the Pope. We have to be recognized. Right? You've heard that. And that's not the thinking of Archbishop of Fath. Yes, we want to be as Catholics under the Pope, but if the Pope is not professing the Roman Catholic faith of all time, then he has a right to our disobedience, and he has a right to our raising our voice and resistance to his destruction of our Catholic Church. And that's what St. Robert Bellarmine said, when you have a bad Pope, even if he's a heretical Pope, he still holds the throne, but as Catholics, we have a duty to resist him and pray for him. St. Robert Bellarmine which the Senate contest, they misquote him, and they only quote parts of him. They don't give the full quotations. So, so what they do, finally, uh, they hunted down Charette. And then when the fall season with the rains and the cold nights, and they're hungry. The soldiers are getting hungry and cold. And it's day after day after day. And the skirmishes keep increasing. And it ended up being, they surrounded the forest where Charette was and his men, his few men left. And they closed in on him and shot him. And uh, they wanted to make sure he didn't die. So they carried his body, they took care of his wounds, and then he had a formal execution. And the great Charette, he, he, his last words were, I die a Roman Catholic, I die in honor of Christ the King, for the king of France and for my lands, our Catholic lands and our altars. And uh, he told the armies, you can shoot when I bow my head. So he lay, gave his last words and he bowed his head and they shot him and he fell to his knees and his soul went to his great reward in heaven. So <clears throat> he died, but the Catholic faith won't die. And remember Garcia Moreno in the Freemasons, he was president of Ecuador in 1874. When they jumped him that morning after he went to Mass, gave his wife a kiss and had breakfast and left for the presidential house, which is actually right near to the convent where the Virgin Mary appeared to Mother Mariana, it's right across the street. He was on his way to his office, his normal routine, and the Freemason, the Masonic Lodge, hired a bunch of uh, thugs and they surrounded him with machetes and just hacked him, hacked him to pieces. And his skull shows, uh, his, they hit really hard in his head so that his skull was even, had a hole in it, his skull. And as he was bleeding, he, he asked to, to be laid at the altar of Our Lady of Sorrows, which is in the cathedral, not far from the, the, the square where the government building in, as in, the, in the convent is. So he died leaning on the altar, giving his soul to God, forgiving his enemies, 
And he was very happy that he had consecrated Ecuador to the Sacred Heart of Jesus just a few years before that. And that's what the Masons hated that he did. They hated him. And they would have revenge also on another bishop who supported Garcia Moreno. They would poison his cruets at the Good Friday Mass of the Pre-Sanctified. And he would drop dead on, at the altar. And they had to carry him away. And uh, so, <clears throat> as, as Garcia Moreno said, you killed me, but God doesn't die. And many Cristeros said this also, and many martyrs in Spain. You can kill me, but Christ the King does not die. And that's what we all need to say. You can kill us, traditional Catholics. You can try to crush us. You can try to destroy us and cause divisions or whatever. <clears throat> but Christ the King doesn't die. The faith will continue. And if we abandon the faith and if we compromise... Father Pfeiffer and I, God will raise someone else. And Father Cordozo and, and his priests are fighting loyally and faithfully in, in South America. And the fake resistance is attacking him also. And they're telling the faithful, don't go to their masses. And why are they saying this? Because they speak out against the words of the prelate who said that it's okay to go to the new mass. Because it gives grace. You can find grace at the new mass. And uh, he's not saying go to the new Mass, but he says there's still grace in the new Mass. But Archbishop Lefebvre was very clear on this. Stay away, it does not give grace, it's sterile. And it'll, um, the opposite will happen, you'll lose your faith going to the new Mass. And the danger of Sedevicantus Masses. Archbishop Lefebvre himself warned against this. So... <clears throat> um, and then um, Father Ribas in Spain, he goes to St. Mass in England. And uh, so there, there are still some priests fighting. And, um, but right now, where are the bishops? Where are our bishops? To preach clear, to hold the line of Archbishop of Feb, where are they? And this is where we are. We're like Sharet. The woods are surrounded. The priests have all been killed off. The church is burnt down. The wives and the old and the young have been surrounded and taken prisoner and shot and buried alive or drowned. This is what's happening to our faith. But let me just end this sermon by a great quote from St. Cyril of Alexandria. The sea that Christ sailed on on the boat. <clears throat> the sea is the figure of the visible world, this world, because the, the sea, the ocean, is in the morning it's calm, in the evening it's wild, in the night it's, it's full of waves, and then in the middle of the night it's calm again. That's how the world is with fashions. And it's, it's loyal to God, it turns from God. It's loyal to Christ the King, and then they, then they crucify him. So that's how the, the people are. The, the, the worship of the people in modern democracy. People are fickle, right? <clears throat> the sea is the visible world, and the church is this little ship, the Catholic Church. And the rowers of the ship are the just, that is, those who are professing the Catholic faith, who, because they have received the Catholic faith, have Christ always present with them, and frequently it is assailed, this little ship, by violent storms and the waves of many persecutions. So the first 300 years of the Catholic Church history, ten brutal, bloody persecutions, right? They beat against this holy bark of the ship of the Catholic Church, and countless trials agitate it. And the cruelty of unclean spirits, the devils, Rage against it and fill it with the fear of death. So how many times have Catholics thought like we, where is this going to go? Are we going to be extinguished? Listen carefully. St. Cyril of Alexandria from the 400s. <clears throat> Nothing new in the history of the church. But Christ is among his chosen servants. And while in his holy wisdom... 
he permits that they suffer persecution, he seems to sleep. And elsewhere, um, St. Saint, Saint, um, John Chrysostom says, he says, notice how St. Mark is the one who brings out, no, Christ is sleeping on a pillow in the boat. And his, the reason he's, he brings us out is, take care of the simple things of life, he says. Such as St. Benedict telling his monks, you can sleep on a bed and you can work with boots. You know, take care of the simple things of life. This, so says uh, the fathers of the church. I continue with St. Cyril of Alexandria. So he, he, he seems to sleep in the storm, but where, when the storm is at its fiercest, and those in the bark of the Catholic Church can endure no more, then ought we to cry out, Arise, why sleepest thou, O Lord? Why do you sleep, O Lord? Why, O Mother of God, do you abandon us? And we've got to cry like this with all our hearts to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And is this not what Our Lady asked at Fatima? Pray your rosaries every day, because so many are being plunged into hell. So many are going to hell, and there will be a great darkness in the church, and a great eclipse, and the Rome will lose the faith, said Our Lady of La Salette, and become the seat. That is, the, the, the ideas where the ideas are spread, the seat of the Antichrist, and maybe someday the actual Antichrist. So, it's this time when we, God wants to hear the few traditional Catholics that are left. He wants to hear your hearts, hear your tears, hear your prayers. To rise to Him, Lord, why do you sleep? Don't abandon us. You promised you would not leave us orphans. Don't leave us orphans. And what does St. Cyril say? Without delay, he will awaken. And take away all thy fear. Christ himself will reprove them that afflict us. And change our mourning, our sorrowing, into joy. Unfolding to us a shining and untroubled sky. For he averts not his face from those that trust in him, who liveth and reigneth with the Father and the Holy Ghost, world without end. Amen. O Mary, conceived without sin, O Mary, conceived without sin, O Mary, conceived without sin, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.